Hello and welcome to the brand new Interwoven podcast, the voice of the North Essex startup community. I'm Alex. And I'm Adam. And we will be your hosts for this collaboration of business startups of all sizes based in North Essex. Buckle up and get ready to meet a whole host of fascinating business owners and entrepreneurs in your local area. You know how some business communities and podcasts can be a bit stuffy and formal? Well, this isn't it. We'll be bringing you interviews, events, local news and opportunities to meet your fellow startups as we dive into the reality of running a business. Best bits, worst bits, fun bits, scary bits and everything in between. Hear from those who are making a real impact with their work, those who are just launching their ideas and local artists who are bringing their creativity to the local area and across the world. This podcast is made for you, by you, and we want you on it. So if you'd love to be part of the Interwoven podcast, come and join us in the free Weave community at wearetheweave.co.uk. We'll drop the link in the podcast description. Come and give us your story, your book recommendation, or a local artist you love. Or maybe you have a feature idea you think would be great for local startups. We're all open to ideas, so drop us a line as quick as you can. In fact, just go and do it right now. Go. So what can you expect in this episode? Well, we'll start by bringing you content from an exciting local startup education and business challenge event called iTeens, which was run by The Weave in conjunction with the University of Essex, and interview with an entrepreneur who is building a business out of random acts of kindness, and a snippet from a local artist who started as a singing teacher and has now made it to America to perform with her band, The Wandering Hearts. We're so excited to bring you this podcast today. So without further ado, let's jump right in and get to the good stuff. So a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of attending the iTeams final at the University of Essex, which was an opportunity for students to work in teams to come up with innovative ideas to local business challenges and then pitch them to a panel to win funding. This event was run by The Weave over a number of weeks, which is really awesome as not only were students getting a chance to win money for their own business ideas, but they also had the opportunity to work with others and develop real business solutions with a diverse team of people. iTeams is such a phenomenal program and an opportunity for both the students, but also for the businesses that we actually work with. James Cracknell, Director of Business Development at The Weave, who created this with the university. We get those students to come together in teams. We put two teams working on a single business challenge and we have three businesses in place. So we have a total of six teams that come together. Um, they act as a consultant. They go through a eight-week program of, of design thinking and development, facilitated learning, and they get to really engage and understand about what it is that the business is really looking for. The businesses, well, they gain fresh insights. They gain access to the latest knowledge and theories that could be within their industry. Um, and it's something that, that from their benefit that really sort of lifts them up. So this year and the last year that we've done this, we've worked with, well, we, we've worked with charities. We've worked with social impact businesses. We've worked with food businesses, e-waste businesses. We've worked with so many different styles of business in this particular field. And it's really been an eye-opener for a lot of those stu students. And I managed to grab a couple of them to find out how the event went. So I'm here with Evelyn, and I wanted to firstly start by asking, how did you find the process of working with a group of people that you've never met before? It has been interesting. It has been a good journey, uh, getting in a team of new people, mixed from different uh, courses, having undergraduates and postgraduates has been very interesting. I've gotten personally to learn a lot from them. At first, I wouldn't have thought I'd have learned something from undergrads who is first year, but really, I've learned a lot about them. And how did you find the process of working with your mentor, Gavin? 
Oh, it's been very interesting. It's been open to us. It's uh, given us so much knowledge. Uh, he's been there when we needed him to watch our presentation before we came here. He was there to and guide us through. And it's been very helpful. And then I asked one of the other participants, Felix, what it was like to present in front of business leaders, mentors and his peers. Oh my God, I could squeeze a gallon of water from my shirts. I'm literally soaked. It was, it looks easy watching from the seats, but then once you get up there, it's just like a whole ball game. The pressure is something else. But it was really nice because it allowed me to get out of my comfort zone. So everything I was afraid of before, I just realized now like it's just a bunch of nonsense in my head. And now to hear from another one of our participants, Melita, on what she felt were some of the challenges of the process. Uh, so the challenges would be definitely because we all have our personal commitments in terms of uh, the coursework that we have to complete and all. But yeah, but uh, surprisingly, everybody on our team was on board and we were dedicated enough to, you know, contribute a, a hundred uh, percent to it. Like even yesterday, like uh, I think Nelson sat like up till 5 a.m. to complete the presentation slides and so did everybody of us we were sitting along with him to complete the slides so that is a level of dedication you know that is required in the team and which I could see it in my team. Mentorship is a big part of the iTeams process so I asked one of the other participants Ore how she found the process of bouncing some ideas off her mentor. Also, our mentor kind of, uh, really provided guidance for us because um, we're not sure about what we're doing. Um, we had different teams within the group with different views. And so we had to submit everything to the mentor to say, okay, help us out with this. Are we doing the right thing or not? And then he was able to guide us. So um, having the mentor on the program really did help us. At least to interpret all the things that we had been learning. And finally, I decided to ask our participants, Felix, Evelyn, Mohammed, and Ore, whether they would recommend the iTeams process to others. Absolutely, 100%. I would recommend everyone, not just anyone, everyone to do this because you learn so much from just working with people and trying to, like, you know, build something together, getting your ideas across. And it also helps you learn lots, like research and presenting. And especially during the eight weeks, every single class we had in every week, we were able to learn something tangible that I feel like I would have with me for life, which was nice. Yeah, yes, I would recommend anyone who's looking to get to interact with other people, to learn more, to learn how to be in teams and also how to present. It's a good way to learn on, and improve on your presentation skills. Sure, it's a very good experience. They have to try it out working with the teams. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. They, they they just use the oh, eight weeks to make to build us or make us mini consultants for businesses. And yeah, it's challenging, it's fun, and then it's nice that we were able to come up with all of these um, solutions. And here is Gavin McClouchy, who was one of the mentors guiding the teams on a weekly basis, giving some of his thoughts on the process. I've not been able to find something exactly kind of that I really want to do. But one of the things that um, I found, I've really found I love is is this process, um, you know, mentoring basically. And as part of the iTeams program, I get a real kind of buzz out of this. Um, and w w when I, even when I was doing that with like, say yourself and, and, and James from that point of view, you know, that for me was the, that's the bit that I really enjoy. So I spent a lot of time helping, supporting, developing people in my old business um, and lovely to see them now have their own businesses in some cases, which is great. I think that's a fantastic kind of legacy for me to look back and think, wow, you know, I had something to do about that. Um, but I realise how much I love this now. So I'm, I'm thinking of potentially doing something around mentoring, but being brave enough to actually just, yeah, go out there and do it for myself. As far as the iTeams program is concerned, one of the things that I find amazing about this particular program is that effectively seven or eight strangers meet the first week. So my perception the first time I mentored on the program was that actually the students knew each other. How and why I thought that, because obviously they're from such a diverse background and I'm just naturally thinking, oh, they know, they all know themselves. Well, no, they don't know themselves, obviously. So I think in the iTunes process that taking seven individuals 
from the start and seven weeks later seeing them present as a team that is fully committed to each other I think that that's a that's a massive amount of gratification when you think that you've been part of that process I think the thing that resonates with me the most is it makes my heart feel good that's what it's about you know from there it's very much about it's not just it's not just how I feel myself that it makes me feel good and feel happy it's like seeing I think you you hit upon a great point it's like seeing the change in them so one of the students that I mentored this year is 19 years old, which you might think, you know, in the context of this program, actually, is very young. Because mm. we've got a lot of mature students, haven't we, on this yeah. program, you know, and, and, and going way through. So this lad is 19 years old and also has been coming every week from South End. So he's not even on this campus. Now, two or three weeks ago when we started to practice, well, not practice the presentation, but we started to talk about who would present and because I'm looking for people that are confident because I don't want to put people under pressure within the, the, the room because a lot of them are not used to presenting and they haven't done it. Reese couldn't even speak to us. So he just he was just too nervous to even speak to members of the uh, you know his team that he's with. A brilliantly active member, but the thought of actually speaking out loud in front of no, it wasn't going to happen. So we had practice after that, and then today before the final presentation, we had a practice run through a couple of times, and he was so nervous. Um, my actual mentor advice was just leave him don't don't let him because it's too much for him to take you know and then I had a quiet word with him outside I just told him to like enjoy himself and very much so that this room is a friendly room so nobody wants them to fail in that room and I think for me so for me personally the biggest thing I got out of this year was watching that young man stand up and deliver his part of the presentation I think yeah I think that development of how they are over that um over that period of time um, and mentoring people for me is also about giving something back. So I didn't think I was good enough to do this to start with. James Cracknell, who is one of the people along with Magda and Adam who run the program, he convinced me basically that, you know, the knowledge and the experience I had was 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 good enough. And I didn't realise that. Um, but But I do have a natural affinity with people. So I do make them feel comfortable. So um, for me, it's been a learning process too. And I'm really pleased that um, from the very first year I did it, it's my third year, very first year I did it, I'm still in contact with three people. Um, and we meet and have a beer and have a bite to eat. So I think that's kind of, if I was looking for any kind of validation of like how well I'd done, then that's nice to carry on the, um, you know, some of the, some of the contact outside of, outside of this as well. So, yeah. It doesn't matter how experienced you are in your business journey, even mentors can suffer from imposter syndrome, as Gavin tells us. Adam, I'm always waiting for someone to tap me on the shoulder and tell me, look, it's all over <laughs> from there. I think that, yeah, I, I think I think I'm more confident now that this is the third year I've done it. But I do sometimes think, what, what have I got, you know, what have I genuinely got to give to these people but you realize that you know you've got so much life experience that they haven't got in a number of cases so it's those kind of things I think and the experience of running a business for years and you know being involved in other businesses buying businesses selling businesses there's actually a lot of things I know so less now which is what's encouraging me to potentially make the jump and you know do this as some kind of part-time part-time job well, I think that'll be a great credit to people surely I think it'd be a wonderful like kind of outcome wouldn't it from from that point of view if anybody will have me and that's the imposter syndrome right there isn't it and finally I decided to ask Gavin about what his advice would be to other people who are thinking about starting something new if you do something like a presentation or something like that I would be saying to people look this is about practice is, is a wonderful thing in the context of something like that. But this is a lot of about believing yourself and what you can do as well. So I think a lot of people lack self-belief and their, their own confidence isn't high. So it's about engaging with them and building their confidence on common ground to be able to enable them to feel that they're confident and capable of doing something that they think they're not. And then it is about them trying it and doing it. And then they realise that they can. And they'll get it wrong to begin with. 
Um, but when we start to walk, I think we fall down a lot more than we do before we can do it. But then we can end up doing it. So it's great. So from there, yeah, I think that's what I'd say. You know, have belief in yourself. Have your own confidence to do something. And I should remind myself of that every night as well. I teams came from the MIT in the States some time ago and has picked up by Cambridge University. And um, I became involved back in the program back in 2016. The university asked me to be a mentor uh, on a pilot program that they were running. It went well, and I was asked um, to then develop that program and run with the initiative. We've been running it now uh, for an additional five or six years afterwards. The Weavers delivered many versions um, of this particular idea. We've developed it. We've um, broadened the program, extended the period. We've delivered it online and offline. Offline is clearly um, better, but online allows us to grow our reach. We've re worked with everybody from PhD social science networks right the way through to the University of Essex undergraduate, postgrads um, and the likes, particularly within the MBAs and the MSEs. Why do I love it? Well, it stands for what we try to do at The Weave. It brings together those aspirational entrepreneurs to our region um, and to engage with university talent. Um, in my career, I've worked, been very fortunate, I've worked with graduates and um, being responsible for developing them as part of um, our particular teams. Um, in the career I had where I was working with the finance sector, certainly we had um, you know, graduates coming in every single year and we worked with them, we developed them, we um, engaged with them fully. So I know and understand the value of talent. And I, I also appreciate the many of the businesses that we get to work with within the region, you know, don't see the value of these kind of newbies of, um, and they see it as an expense or a cost and not a particular benefit. I believe they're mad to do so. I think they're the clarion call of business that, that recent graduates um, are not business savvy. Um, it's as much a responsibility of the business to correct as it is to the educational establishments opening up those opportunities. So so I think that that kind of poo-hooing of the idea of working with students is something that we've got to overcome within the, the weave. And we've got to really connect and understand why it's so valuable to bring these two entities together. So if we to overcome this blockage between aspiration and real sustainable growth, then we have to learn to engage with the next generation of talent. So if the kind of the message that I want to leave everybody with at this particular point is, you know, if anybody wants to know more about this program, then contact and join the Weave because we're on a journey. We're on a mission to bring aspiration alive, give it opportunity, get small businesses connected to the innovation um, system to get them thinking about fresh ideas and, and not just thinking and, and sort of engaging with that particular process, but actually connecting them with the resources that they really need to make things happen. It was an inspiring event, and I hope we'll get to run it again next year. Talking of events, we've discovered some great events coming up for you guys in the next month. Ambitious Women in Essex have got a great sounding networking event on in Braintree on the 14th of June from 5pm. It's in the Big Bear Cider Mill. How cool is that? Cider tasting and networking. What more could you ask for? There's also another event they're running in Billericay on the 21st. I went to an Ambitious Women event last month, actually, and had an absolutely fabulous time with some fab company, so I would highly recommend. The Regis Franciscan House in Ipswich, hope I said that right, is running free trial days for their co-working office space at the moment. Charter Hall in Colchester are hosting a Spring into Business Expo featuring loads of local businesses on the 8th of June. And there's also a networking opportunity in nearby Wivenhoe for small businesses on the 2nd of June. And in terms of something less businessy, First Sight has an exhibition on at the moment called Big Women. First Sight in Colchester, that is. Curated by a Suffolk-based artist, Sarah Lucas. All about questions and themes relating to womanhood. And the Colchester Arts Centre have got a full programme after their very exciting hosting of Blur this month. They start the month with the 36th Colchester Beer and Cider Festival, which is always a favourite of mine, and have an event which is showcasing some of the newest talent from the Colchester Institute on the 17th of June. 
And you can find details of all of these events on the events page in the community. So just go to wearetheweave.co.uk. Want to design your freelance life the way you want it? Well, check out our book recommendation from Carla Watkins, who moved into her business and branding photography business five years ago and has never looked back. I'm Carla Watkins, and my book recommendation is Be a Free Range Human by Marianne Cantwell. It was the book that taught me to create a business designed around me rather than trying to fit myself in an existing box, and also introduced the concept of testing an idea on real people before spending extensive money and time developing it. Full disclosure, I'm a case study in the current edition of the book, but that's because it worked wonders. I'm really excited to be bringing you an interview in this episode with a local entrepreneur with big ideas and a big heart. Nigel Richardson runs Secret Hamper, a business built around providing random acts of kindness to make everyone smile. I love how a random act of kindness is just good for everyone involved. The receiver gets something they weren't expecting for the day and makes them realise the world really does have good people in it. And the giver gets that warm, fuzzy feeling of having helped someone out. Nigel started the secret hamper from a single idea and has now provided hampers to individuals, businesses and most notably hospitals all around the country. His Thank You NHS campaign made it to the National News and the Jason Vale podcast and has provided hundreds of hampers to hardworking hospital staff to brighten their days. I particularly love his story of how he got started. So let's have a listen. Hi, Alex. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And it's really, really lovely to have you here. I'm very excited to talk to you about your business because I've been doing a bit of reading about it and it just oh, it just fills me with all sorts of happiness and joy. So oh, um, so tell me a little bit about um, Secret Hamper, uh, what it is and how it came about. Yeah, sure. So basically back in 2015, I took voluntary redundancy from the city, um, a career that I've been in for 25 plus years. Um, it got to a point where I just felt it come to its natural end. So I managed to sort of negotiate voluntary redundancy and brokered a deal with my wife to let me have a few months off over the summer so I could spend some time with her and the children. And uh, yeah, so it's nice just to reconnect with them because obviously working city hours you know, I was leaving home at 4.30, getting home at 8.30, um, you know, and missing the kids grow up and all those sort of sunny days out that having the summer holidays. So um, I managed to negotiate that on the premise that I'll definitely go and get a new job in September. Um, September come and it was like, oh, my God, what do I do now? So I dug out my CV and, you know, sent it off to a few places and didn't get any response whatsoever. And uh, I thought, oh, my goodness, I don't know what to do. So I just printed some flyers, popped some through some letterboxes just to a handyman um, and just went around and did some painting and decorating and odd jobs for various different neighbours in the village and stuff like that, uh, just to sort of tick over, not to necessarily earn money, uh, more to just sort of, you know, keep my mind active than anything else. And um, it then got to December and it was like, my goodness, you know, my wife's saying, look, come on, what's going on? You know, you need to find a job. And I said, well, look, it's Christmas time now. Let's, you know, let's worry about it in January. Let's just enjoy Christmas. And then we were sitting there watching the TV and an advert came on for the co-op where two guys are playing a computer game and then they go to the fridge and there's nothing in there. And one of the guys says, well, I'm going to go down the shops. And as he goes out of the, out of the house, he sees his elderly neighbour across the street, comes to the front door, open it up with his shopper on wheels and looks down at the pavement, which is all frozen over. And then another young guy comes skating past on the pavement and they start playing the bolero music. And the old guy just looks down and shaves his head and goes back indoors. And so then the next scene, you see this, the, the original youngster in the co-op and he remembers the old guy and he starts filling up a bag of groceries. And then, and then you see him leave it on the guy's doorstep, ring the doorbell and, and walk off. And then the, next, and the ending scene, if you like, is a guy sat in the window of his kitchen with a hot cup of tea and the fairy lights are on and it's just all lovely. And this guy has done a, a random act of kindness. And that really hit a note with me because earlier in the summer, I'd done a little bit of work with our parish council and uh, they asked me to go out to try and get some signatures and find out why 
people would use our church rooms so we could try and um, uh, bid for some lottery funding uh, to get the church rooms done up. And I came across this guy and he was on his own. He'd lost his wife and, you know, he's very lonely. And he just said, oh, he said, oh, he said, he said come in, come in. He said, I've not seen anyone for two weeks. He said, you know, he said, I don't see the post, I just don't see anyone. So I've gone in and he, he told me how he lost his wife and since losing his wife, the neighbours on each side wouldn't speak to him anymore. They just kept their heads down. And it may be that they were just embarrassed or didn't know what to say to him. But ultimately, he was lonely. And, uh, you know, I just spent all my afternoon around his house drinking copious amounts of cup of tea, eating loads of biscuits and, you know, going home with one signature instead of like 30 or 40, which I'd have been asked to get. And that advert reminded me of this guy Harry and I just felt this feeling I needed to go and, and do what this guy had done on the advert so I jumped in the car I went to Tesco's and at 12 minutes past 10 on the 23rd of December at night it was chucking it down with rain I got out of the car and put my foot in a pothole up to my knee in, in freezing cold water and then you know limped up to Harry's doorstep and put this bag of groceries down rang the doorbell legged it back to the car and drove off home Got in, my wife, I looked like a drowning rat. My wife said to me, where on earth have you been? She'd been upstairs putting the kids to bed and stuff. And uh, so I've just done this act of kindness thing. I said, you know, that advert we saw on the telly, I've just done that. She goes, what are you talking about? And I said, I've just done this thing. I said, but I feel really good about myself. I feel, you know, up until that point, I've been drifting a little bit. I didn't have any sense of purpose. Um, Inside, I was panicking. I didn't feel very good about myself because I was feeling like I was letting my family down. I couldn't find a job. And, you know, when I worked in the city, I was good at what I did, but I just didn't want to do it anymore. And uh, I, was, I didn't know what to do. And, and this gave me a purpose. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could share this feeling that I've just got of giving and hopefully making a difference with other people and create a platform to spread kindness one box at a time. And because it was Christmas time, I thought, Let's have a little play on words. Everyone talks about these in the office about secret Santas. Why can't we have a secret hamper where we could send a box of everyday essentials um, to someone anonymously? So take away that stigma if someone was struggling or needed a little bit of help but wouldn't reach out too proud to ask for any help. Something turned up anonymously that they couldn't turn away. You know, that could make a huge difference to them. So that's how it all really started out. And... Um, we kind of evolved from there over time. So we initially started with like care home hampers. So if you had a, a relative in a care home, you could send a, a thank you in to maybe the staff for looking after your loved one that then could be shared with the residents. You could have, um, we even done one for dog homes. So if you took a, an animal in from a rescue centre, instead of making a financial donation, you could maybe send in a box of goodies for, for the other dogs that were left behind. I mean, it's a bit, bit mad, but dog people get it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we had like student hampers. So mum and dad could send a little um, rescue package to kids off at uni. Um, and then newborn hampers. So there'll be stuff in there, but, you know, like wet wipes, nappies, and a, a meal that dad could put together quickly and stuff like that. And a bit of you know, pampering stuff for mum in there as well. So it wasn't necessarily all about the baby and loads of baby grows. It was just the essentials of a few treats for mum and dad as well. Um, and then I went to a networking. I started throwing myself into networking meetings. I've never been to one before. And the first time I went to one of these ones, they asked me to stand up and talk about myself for 30 seconds. And I thought, you're having a laugh, aren't you? <laughs> I was like... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You did, and I said to the lady that invited me, I said, you never told me this. She goes, if I know if I told you, you wouldn't have come. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> so um, it was from one of those net two things happened on that networking meeting. I met um, a lady at Farley Hospice who was doing some fundraising and she said, look, um, would you like to take part in our £50 challenge? And I said, well, what on earth is that? She said, well, we give you £50 and then you have to go off over a period of three months and try and turn that 50 pounds into as much money as possible. So I thought, yeah, I quite like the idea of that. And I thought, what on earth am I going to do? I said, well, worst case scenario, I don't spend the 50 pounds and they get the 50 quid back at the end of the three months. So I got to thinking, you know, what we could do. And the second thing that happened there, I met somebody from Morden District Council that said, 
you know, why don't you do a Malden box? And I went, to my knowledge, all we've got is Malden and sea salt. You know, I know there's maybe a couple of breweries, but that's not much in a hamper. So then I started, well, went home. I was thinking about this 50 pound challenge and I was thinking about this Malden hamper. So with a 50 pound challenge, I thought, well, not many people know of me. And um, what could I do to raise our profile that would also help other people along the way? Because that's our, you know, the whole random act of kindness and paying it forward is it's the foundations the business is built on. So then I thought, well, how about I've got this massive van that I'm driving around in. We approach local businesses and say, look, you can sponsor a space on the van for 50 pounds. I'll stick your logo on the side of the van for a year. And that 50 pounds that you pay will go to Farley Hospice. So we did that and managed to, to raise 5,000 pounds for the hospice and did that two years. Yeah, so I did that two years running and uh, we raised over 10,000 pounds for the for the uh, charity and was their top fundraiser for two years running. So that was the first thing that was really amazing. <clears throat> and uh, and then I started Googling Essex produce and then we, we came up with loads of different items that were made in the county. And obviously the most obvious one would be tip tree. But then all of a sudden I found a lady that made Christmas puddings. I found a guy that made popcorn, got Fairfield Farm Chris, shaking out a milkshake. And it, it just went on, you know. And I'd probably say two thirds of what we do are alcohol beverages, <laughs> which doesn't say much for the county. But, you know, it's amazing what's out there and the quality of it as well. And they're all passionate about their businesses. And I'm really proud to say that we've got a really fantastic offering. And we can, you know, most of what we do when it comes to the Essex hamper is bespoke. In any case, we've got a, a base one that people can buy. But um, I'd say the majority of what we send out is probably bespoke. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just incredible, really. And it's just, we've been, you know, and then obviously um, I'm constantly thinking about how to think outside the box a little bit and just be a little bit different. You know, I just thought, well, what can we do to try and get ourselves out there a little bit and, and um, be a little bit different? Because I didn't just wake up one day and say, you know what, I want to sell gift hampers. It was, I want to make a difference. And I know we all do, and that sounds like a bit of a cliche, but <clears throat> it was like, what can we do that's fun and make a difference and bring a smile to people's faces? Because I genuinely think that most human beings love that feeling of giving. Oh, so much. There's not a day that doesn't go past that I, doesn't, I don't think about my dad. Mm. And um, <clears throat> I sometimes think, you know, I'd love to, you know, would it, would, I, would it have been good to have been there when he passed or not? Or, you know, I don't know. You know, I really don't know. But I never really got to say goodbye to him properly. And, uh, but all I can say, I was thankful for that nurse that, that was there. And um, it always played on my mind that that box of biscuits was never enough. And then when my third child was born, my wife had a, uh, an emergency operation because she had a placenta previa. And um, <clears throat> she started hemorrhaging and, you know, obviously try, trying to look after her while getting the baby out. And, you know, it's all, all turned into a mate, alarms going off and everything. But, Thankfully, those guys didn't have a bad day in the office. You know, you think, you know, they can't afford to have a bad day in the office. You know, they really can't. And, uh, you know, there's two lives there at risk that day, and they both came out of it, thankfully. And um, I just thought, you know what? I need to be able to do something, but I can't do it on my own. You know, I'm not big enough. You know, I'm not a Google. I'm not a big Tesco's or anything like that. But what could I do? And then I thought back to the Farley Hospice thing about sponsoring the space in the van. I thought, well, what if people sponsored a hamper? <clears throat> because, you know, what do you get for 70 quid as a business these days in marketing terms? Not a lot. You know, you wouldn't even get a paragraph in a magazine for that. You know, so I'd either put it on our socials and I'd say, look, what do you think about this? It's the NHS's 70th anniversary. You know, they're unsung heroes. We all know someone that either works in the NHS or um, as I said dealings with the NHS. We've all probably 99% of us have been born in hospitals and we, we had their care to bring us into the world. It's time to give a little bit back and say thank you and show those that care for others that we care. And believe it or not, within two weeks, I managed to, in the local community, I've got 70 hampers sponsored by 70 businesses for 70 pounds each. Yeah. So it's like incredible. That's amazing. So you actually carried on through through the lockdown then? I didn't realise. Yeah. Yeah, we did it. We couldn't obviously do any full deliveries to hospitals because... The whole point of it was, was we kind of made a bit of an event of it. 
but we couldn't, you know, hospitals were on lockdown, so they were a no-no. But what I could do was, you know, into their goods in area, I could deliver a hamper. Everything you're doing with Secret Hamper is so, it, it's it's like all of these positive things. It's like the great feeling of giving, the great feeling of being appreciated and you're supporting local businesses and you're supporting charities. I mean, that's a lot of goodness in one business, right? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice, you know, it's, um, because it's just nice to be involved in something where, that brings a smile. You know, yeah. there's so, so much, you know, we're on the planet for such a, a short space of time. Sometimes it can feel like an eternity, but when you really sort of drum it down, it's such a sort of short space of time. Ultimately, I mean, the day to day business is we are a hamper business, but with a difference is that, you know, we try and pay it forward and we support. I know there are other companies out there that will use locally sourced products and stuff like that, but, it, you know, we've got that kind of backstory where it all come from. And there's loads of stories. I mean, one very quick one is that when we launched the business, I went around just to do sort of like guerrilla type marketing and went into a care home and said, look, could we give you one of our um, hampers for some fo- in return for some photos? And all the, all the care home hamper really is, is just for the cake and biscuits, um, box of tea bags and a nostalgic CD. And uh, the idea is that they can share all the contents in the community area, whack a CD on and get a few people up dancing and singing. And that CD is so powerful because it can really help people suffering with dementia. Yes. Yeah, we had two instances. In one care home we went into, um, the manageress started crying. I went, are you all right? I said, we haven't crossed the line, have we? And she said, no, no. She said, you see that lady over there? She said, that's the first time she's got out of that chair in two years. And, you know, she was up wow. dancing. Yeah, and singing. You That's know, she amazing. Said she just sits, all she does is stare at space every day. She said, you come in, whack this CD on, and she's got a party hat on, she's up dancing, having the time of her oh, life. What and a feeling like, that must it's be. So, it's so powerful. And, yeah. um Wow, that's amazing. And and this is the thing, like, I, I mean, I've done a couple of random acts of kindness in my in my life, and I, I wouldn't say I saved a life necessarily, but it's just that it makes such a difference to some people. Like, to you, it might be, you know, a, you know a, a cup of coffee that you give someone sitting homeless on the street, but to them, that might completely change their day um, or life, and it's just, it, it's just, brilliant like it's such a good feeling for, for everyone i think yeah absolutely and, and again i know i keep harping on about the nhs one but what would have happened you know let's just say we fast forwarded it kind of thing and my dad was still around but that nurse that held his hand decided that morning you know what i've had enough of this i'm not doing this anymore and the next day wasn't there to hold my dad's hand do you know what i mean so by doing that the lives it's because those con- when we send those boxes in, there's about four thousand items across the seventy-five boxes. So the idea is they just take one or two items out, so they reach a good two or three thousand people at a time, at all levels of an NHS. And you can feel the buzz around the hospital. You can, by the time you leave, people are buzzing, you know, and it's crazy. And um, you know, my, you know. Yeah, we don't do it for money. I've had people look say to me, you're absolutely bonkers. That's not the way to run a business. It's like, yeah, I get all that. But sometimes, you know, what goes around comes around. And then hopefully some of those people that are sponsored the boxes will come back and remember before they hit that Amazon button down the line, they might think, actually, who was that company we dealt with? Yeah, that was brilliant. You know, we love being involved in that campaign. And not only that, it gives businesses something else to talk about on their blogs. And, you know, with their staff and stakeholders, whoever it might be. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, some amazing stories come out of that as well, you know. So, um, and also, I mean, I'm very passionate about the Essex Hamper range. You know, there's lots of small businesses out there that are doing such great things and making some fantastic products that the likes of your Tesco's and your Sainsbury's and all these sort of places, not necessarily that's where they maybe want to end up because sometimes it's detrimental to their business to end up in those places, even though people think it's great to. They'd never get entertained in some of these places, but at least I feel that if I can, you know, hopefully if my business grows and we're sending out thousands of hampers a year, we're helping these other businesses grow their businesses. And 
that in turn means they can grow, they can employ people, put money back into the economy and so forth. So it goes full circle. You've obviously got so many like great parts to your business and so much that you're doing already. Have you got anything that you really would love to do and make an impact in in the future with Secret Hamper? I want to be known as a place, you know, like when you go, like say Moonpig or, or you uh, compare the market, those type of things. I'd like to be known as a household name to where people go, I want to make a random act of kindness. It's that you become a household name, basically, for whatever that might be. Uh, that would be like the end game for me. You know, Amazon is soulless, you know, really. It's convenient. And we're all, we live in that world now where we want it yesterday. But sometimes by just taking that extra few minutes to think about it, you can send a really thoughtful gift to make a real difference. And that's what we want to be a part of. I mean, I know that there's lots of other businesses out there and there's space for everyone. My uh, plea is to people that might be listening is that, just take a step back sometimes when you're looking to whether it's with us or anyone else just try and see if there's a, if you could get the same level of service and you'll probably get even better by shopping locally you know we don't want our high streets just to be empty you know because they're they're vibrant they can be vibrant places and you know lots of these people rely on on stuff you know whereas jeff bozos probably doesn't give a monkey if you buy an amazon voucher Absolutely. It's a drop in the ocean for them and such a big deal for either whoever your random random kindness goes to or those companies that you're supporting, the local businesses you're supporting through stocking your hampers. So absolutely, I it's it's such a great business idea and I'm so glad we got to feature oh, on the you. podcast. It's amazing. <laughs> so you. do you have a couple of minutes to do our quick fire round for the end of the podcast? Absolutely. Go for it. Okay, so I've got five questions for you. And the only rule is you're not allowed to spend too long thinking about it. Okay. <laughs> so, firstly, <laughs> firstly, favorite band? When? <laughs> Give my age away there, sorry. <laughs> oh, nice classic. Okay. The last film or series you watched? Stranger Things. Oh, so good. Oh, it's so good. What meal would you choose to have on your birthday? Ooh. Uh, ooh, uh, ooh. A Thai meal. Thai. I'd have a nice Thai. How about a, a book or a blog that you would recommend to other people who are starting a business? Um, I depends on what type of business you're doing, but I think every business should be looking to make a difference. Otherwise, you shouldn't be in business. I can't think who the author is, but it's called The Go-Giver. It's not a true book. It's not like a factual book as such. It's more of a sort of parable, um, if I've said that correctly. Um, but it's five little short stories that lead up to the end part. But it's all about giving and, you know, being rewarded for, for giving, basically. Give first, receive later, which is pretty much what Secret Hand is all about. Best piece of advice you've been given? Um, I would say believe in yourself, because if you don't believe in yourself, why should others? Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was lovely to have you here. Your personality comes through in your business. It's, it, it's brilliant. <laughs> oh, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> I hope this isn't the last we hear of Secret Hamper. Um, we're hoping to have a few little um, snippets into what Secret Hamper are doing over the next few episodes. So we shall hear from you again. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Alex. It's been great talking to you. <laughs> What's it like to live locally in Essex, but be part of a band that lives across the country and travels internationally? Well, let's find out and hear from Tara Wilcox-Leach, a beautiful and talented one third of the Wandering Hearts, an Americana band with stunning vocals, which was formed in 2015. Hi, I'm Tara from the Wandering Hearts, and I'm really pleased to be talking to Interwoven today. I've seen them come I've seen them go Some move fast. The Wandering Hearts formed in 2015 
we didn't actually know one another. We had some mutual friends who'd put us in touch and suggested, as we were four unfulfilled musicians that had a love of harmony singing, um, that we might we might be a good fit. So there were two guys, uh, two girls. We were looking at original songs. From that very first rehearsal, it just felt really clear very, very quickly that what we had had the potential to be something that was really, really quite special. I suppose the best, probably most surreal moment of being in the band would have been opening for Celine Dion at Hyde Park. Um, I guess that would maybe have been 2019. We were on the, we'd opened for Tom Petty uh, a few years prior and Eric Clapton, um, but this was our first time on the big main stage um, and performing there, coming off stage and then watching Celine Dion's performance. She, uh, she name, she name checked us. She said, you know, lovely to have the wandering hearts, how wonderful we were. And that was, that was mad. That was probably the craziest experience having grown up with the influence of, uh, you know, my heart will go on in Titanic and trying to sound by hook or by crook, like Celine Dion, um, to have her name check you was, was pretty mad. So that'll, that'll, that'll stay with me. In terms of advice to other musicians who would look to advance their career, I would always bring it back to why you're doing it. Um, I never got into this industry for the money. Um, if that is the goal, there are probably easier, I'd say definitely, um, easier ways of doing that than trying to carve that out in the music industry. Um, and I also think you really want to know yourself and know your brand. I think so often we determine our ability based on the feedback of others. And whilst I think that's an important guide, sometimes I've done an under par performance and someone said, God, that was brilliant. But I've known really it, it, it wasn't very good. And there's been other times where I've done the best I could possibly be. And perhaps we didn't get that record deal or perhaps we didn't get the adulation that we might have wanted. And I think knowing yourself is really important, particularly in an industry where the goals seem to change so much and the industry is always evolving. I think you always want to bring it back to why you're doing it. And for me, if there was nobody particularly interested or a very small amount of people interested and there was no money, um, you'd still do it because that's it's something that, you know, I do all the time anyway, singing and writing songs, it's catharsis and it's joy and that's really what it's about. And so if you can bring it back to that, anything else is a bonus because you're gonna do it anyway. If you want to check them out, they'll be supporting the fabulous Jack Savaretti on his tour this summer. Well, in true Warner Brothers style, that's all, folks. The first episode of Interwoven is complete, and the start of a new journey for North Essex startups has begun. In our next episode, we'll be featuring a fun networking and pitching event run by The Weave, and an interview with the one and only Sarah McKee Harris, who has built her successful HR consultancy business from scratch. But what about you? What do you want to hear? Who do you want to know? What do you have to say as a local Essex startup? Come and join us in the Weave community at wearetheweave.co.uk and tell us. Bring your voice to the community and we'll weave it into something magical. So until next time, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me and we'll look forward to seeing you in the community. 